All right, we're back in the glass bead game again. Um, what I wanted to do next was uh, I'm going to read uh, George Berkeley's The Three Dialogues Between Hillis and Philonis. And uh, I may uh, try to read this entire book. Uh, so I'm just going to start at the beginning and uh, we'll see where it goes. Philonis, good morning, Hillis. I did not expect to find you aboard so early, Hillis. It is indeed something unusual, but my thoughts were so taken up with the subject I was discoursing of last night that finally I could not sleep. I resolved to rise and take a turn in the garden. Philonis, it happened well to let you see what innocent and agreeable pleasures you lose every morning. Can there be a pleasanter time of the day or a more delightful season of the year. That purple sky, these wild but sweet notes of birds, the fragrant bloom upon the trees and flowers, the gentle influence of the rising sun, these and a thousand nameless beauties of nature inspire the soul with secret transports, its faculties too being at this time fresh and lively, are fit for those meditations which the solitude of a garden and tranquility of the morning naturally dispose us to. But I am afraid I interrupt your thoughts, for you seem very intent on something. Hillis, it is true, I was and shall be obliged to you if you will permit me to go on in the same vein, not that I would be by any means deprive myself of your company, for my thoughts always flow more easily in conversation with a friend than when I am alone, but my request is that you would would suffer me to impart my reflections on you. Philonis, with all my heart, it is what I should have requested myself if you had not pre prevented me. Hillis, I was considering the odd fate of those men who have in all ages through an affection of being distinguished from the vulgar or some unaccountable turn of thought pretend either to believe nothing at all or to believe the most extravagant things in the world. This, however, might be borne if their paradoxes and skepticism did not draw after some consequences of general disadvantage to mankind. But the mischief lies here that when men of less leisure see them who are supposed to have spent their whole time in pursuits of knowledge, professing an entire ignorance of all things or advancing such notions as are repugnant to plain and commonly received principles, they will be tempted to entertain suspicious concerning the most important truths which they had hitherto held sacred and unquestionable. Philonis, I entirely agree with you as to the ill tendency of the affected doubts of some philosophers and fantastical conceits of others. I am even so far gone of late in this way of thinking that I have quitted several of the sublime notions I got in their schools for vulgar opinions, and I give it you on my word, since this revolt from metaphysical notions to the plain dictates of nature and common sense, I find my understanding strangely enlightened, so that I can now easily comprehend a great many things which before were all mystery and riddle. Hillis, I am glad to find there was nothing in the accounts I heard of you. Philonis, pray, what were those? Hillis, you were represented in last night's conversation as one who maintained the most extravagant opinion that ever entered into the mind of man, namely that there is no such thing in a material substance in the world. Philonis, that there is no such thing as what philosophers call material substance. I am seriously persuaded, but if I were made to see anything absurd or skeptical in this, I should then have the same reason to renounce this, that I imagine I now reject the contrary opinion. Hillis, what? Can anything be more fantastic, more repugnant to common sense, or a more manifest piece of skepticism? than to believe that there is no such thing as matter? Philonis, softly, good Hillis, what if it should prove that you who hold there is 
are by virtue of that opinion a greater skeptic and maintain more paradoxes and repugnancies to common sense than I who believe no such thing. Hillis, you may as soon persuade me the part is greater than the whole as that, in order to avoid absurdity and skepticism, I should ever be obliged to give up my opinion in this point. Philonus, well then, are you content to admit that opinion of true which upon examination shall appear most agreeable to common sense and remote from skepticism? Hillis, with all my heart, since you are for raising disputes about the plain, plainest things in nature, I am content for once to hear what you have to say. Philonus, pray Hillis, what do you mean by a skeptic? Hillis, I mean what all men mean, one that doubts of everything. Philonus, he then who entertains no doubt concerning some particular point with regard to that point cannot be thought a skeptic? Hillis, I agree with you. Philonus, of which does doubting consist in embracing the affirmative or negative side of a question? Hillis, in neither, for whoever understands English cannot but know that doubting signifies a suspense between both. Philonus, he then that denies any point can no more be said of doubt of it than he who affirms it with the same degree of assurance. Hillis, true. Philonius, and consequently, for such as denial is no more to be esteemed a skeptic than the other. Hillis, I acknowledge it. Philonus, how comes it to pass then, Hillis, that you pronounce me a skeptic because I deny what you affirm, namely the existence of matter? Since for all you can tell, I am as peremptory in my denial as you in your affirmation. Hillis, hold, Philonus, I have been a little out, of, out in my definition, but every false step a man makes in discourse is not to be insisted on. I said indeed that a skeptic was one who doubted of everything, but I should have added, or who denies the reality and truth of things. Philonus, what things? Do you mean the principles and theorems of sciences? But these, you know, are universal intellectual notions, and consequently independent of matter. The denial, therefore, of this does not imply denying them. Hillis, I grant it, but are there no, no other things? What do you think of distrusting the senses, of denying the real existence of sensible things, or pretending to know nothing of them? Is not this sufficient to dominate a man a skeptic? Philonus, shall we therefore examine which of us is that denies the reality of sensible things or professes the greatest ignorance of them? Since, if I take you rightly, he is to be esteemed the greatest skeptic. Hillis, that is what I desire. Philonus, what mean you by sensible things? Hillis, those things which are perceived by the senses. Can you imagine what I mean anything else? Philonus, pardon me, Hillis, if I am desirous clearly to apprehend your notions, since they may much shorten our inquiry. Suffer me then to ask you this further question. Are those things only perceived by the senses, which are perceived immediately? Or may those things properly be said to be sensible, which are perceived immediately, or not without the intervention of others. Hillis, I do not sufficiently understand you. Philonus, in reading a book, what I immediately perceive are the letters, but immediately, or by means of these, are suggested to my mind, the notions of God, virtue, truth, etc. Now that the letters are truly sensible things, or perceived by senses, there is no doubt, but I would know whether you take the things suggested by them to be so too. Hillis, no, certainly. It would be absurd to think God or virtue sensible things, though they may be signified and suggested to the mind by sensible marks with which they have an ar arbitrary connection. Philonus, it seems then that by sensible things you mean those only which can be perceived immediately by sense. Hillis, right. Philonus, does it not follow from this that though I see one part of the sky red and another blue, and that my reason does not evidently conclude 
there must be some cause of that diversity of colors, yet the cause cannot be said to be sensible thing or perceived by the sense of seeing. Hillis, it does. Philonus, in like manner, though I hear variety of sounds, yet I cannot be said to hear the cause of those sounds. Hillis, you cannot. Philonus, and when my touch I perceive a thing to be hot and heavy, I cannot say with any truth or propriety that I feel the cause of its heat or weight. Hillis, to v prevent any more questions of this kind, I tell you once and for all that by sensible things I mean those only by which are perceived by sense, and then that in truth that the senses perceive nothing which they do not perceive immediately for they make no inferences. The deducing therefore of cause or occasions from effects and appearances which alone are perceived by sense entirely rates, relates to reason. Philonus, the point then is agreed upon between us that sensible things are those only which are immediately perceived by sense. You will further inform me whether we immediately perceive by sight anything besides light and colors and figures or by hearing anything but sounds, by the palate anything besides taste, by smell, smell besides odors, or by touch more than tangible qualities. Hillis, we do not. Philonus, it seems therefore that if you take away all sensible qualities, there remains nothing sensible. Hillis, I grant it. Philonus, sensible things therefore are nothing else but so many sensible qualities or combination of sensible qualities. Hillis, nothing else. Philonus, heat then is a sensible thing? Hillis, certainly. Philonus, does the reality of sensible things consist in being perceived, or is it something distinct from their being perceived, and that bears no relation to the mind? Hillis, to exist is one thing, and to be perceived is another. Philonus, I speak with regard to sensible things only, and of these I ask whether by their real existence you mean a subsistence exterior to the mind and distinct from their being perceived. Hillis, I mean a real absolute being distinct from and without any relation to their being perceived. Philonus, heat therefore, if it is allowed a real being, must exist without the mind. Hillis, it must. Philonus, tell me, Hillis, is the real existence equally compatible to all degrees of heat which we perceive, or is there any reason why we should attribute it to some and deny it to others? And if there is, pray let me know what the reason. Hillis, whatever degree of heat we perceive by sense, we may be sure the same exists in the object that occasions it. Philonus, what? the greatest as well as the least? Hillis, I tell you, the reason is plainly the same in respect of both. They are both perceived by sense. No, the greater degree of heat is more sensibly perceived, and consequently, if there is any difference, we are more certain of its real existence than we can be of the reality of a lesser degree. Philonus, but it is not the most vehement and intense degree of heat a very great pain? Hillis, no one can deny it, Philonus. And is any unperceiving thing capable of pain or pleasure? Hillis, no, certainly. Philonus, is your material substance a senseless being or a being endowed with sense and perception? Hillis, it is a senseless, it is senseless without doubt. Philonus, it cannot therefore be the subject of pain? Hillis, by no means. Philonus, nor consequently of the greatest heat perceived by sense, since you acknowledge this to be no small pain, Hillis, I grant it. Philonus, what shall we say then of your external object? Is it a material substance or not? Hillis, it is a material substance with the sensible qualities inhering in it. Philonus, how can, how then can a great heat exist in it? since you own it cannot a material substance, I desire you would clear this point. Hillis, hold, Philonus, I fear I was out in yielding intense heat to be a pain. 
it should seem rather that pain is something distinct from heat and the consequence or effect of it. Polonis. Upon putting your hand near the fire, do you perceive one simple uniform sensation or dis two distinct sensations? Hillis, but one simple sensation. Philonus, is not the heat immediately perceived? Hillis, it is. Philonus, and the pain? Hi Hillis, true. Philonus, seeing therefore they are both immediately perceived at the same time, and the fire affects you only with one simple or uncompounded idea, it follows that this simple idea is both the intense heat immediately perceived and the pain, and consequently that the intense heat immediately perceived is nothing distinct from a particular sort of pain. Hillis, it seems so. Philonus, again, try in your thoughts, Hillis, if you can perceive a vehement sensation to be without pain or pleasure. Hillis, I cannot. Philonus, or can you frame to yourself an idea of sensible pain or pleasure in general, abstracted from every particular idea of heat, cold, taste, smells, etc. Hillis, I do not find that I can. Philonus, does it not therefore follow that sensible pain is nothing distinct from those sensations or ideas in an intense degree? Hillis, it is undeniable and to speak the truth, I begin to suspect a very great heat cannot exist but in a mind perceiving it. Philonus, what? Are you then in that skeptical state of suspense between affirming and denying? Hillis, I think I may be positive in that point. A very violent and painful heat cannot exist without the mind. Phyllis, it, is, it has not therefore, according to you, any real being? Hillis, I own it. Philonus, is it therefore certain that there is no body in nature really hot? Hillis, I have not denied there is any real heat in bodies. I only say there is no such thing as an intense real heat. Philonus, but did you not say before that all degrees of heat were equally real, or if there was any difference, the greater would be more undoubtedly real than the lesser? Hillis, true. But it was because I did not then consider the, the ground there is for distinguishing between them, which I now plainly see. And is this because intense heat is nothing else but a particular kind of painful sensation, and pain cannot exist but in a perceiving being? It follows that no intense heat can really exist in an unperceiving corporal substance. But this is no reason why we should deny heat in an inferior degree to exist in such a substance. Philonus, but how shall we be able to discern those degrees of heat which exist only in the mind from those which exist without? Hillis, that is no difficult matter. You know the least pain cannot exist unperceived? Whatever, therefore, degree of heat is a pain exists only in the mind. But as for all other degrees of heat, nothing obliges us to think the same of them. Philonus, I think you granted before that no unperceiving being was capable of pleasure any more than pain. Hillis, I did. Philonus, and is not warmth a more gentle degree of heat than what causes uneasiness a pleasure? Hillis, what then? Philonus, consequently, it cannot exist without the mind in an unperceiving substance or holy body. Hillis, so it seems. Philonus, since therefore as well those degrees of heat that are not painful are those that are can exist only in a thinking substance, may we not conclude that external bodies are absolutely incapable of any degree of heat whatsoever? Hillis, on second thought, I do not think it so evident that warmth is a pleasure as that a great degree of heat is a pain. Philonus, I do not pretend that warmth is a great is as great a pleasure as heat is a pain, but if you grant it to be even a small pleasure, it serves to make good my conclusion. Hillis, I could rather call it an indolence. It seems to be nothing more than a privation of both pain and pleasure, and that such a quality or state as this may be an unthinkable substance. I hope you will not deny. Philonus, if you are resolved to maintain that warmth, 
or a gentle degree of heat is no pleasure, I, I know not how to convince you otherwise than by appealing to your own sense. But what do you think of cold? Hillis, the same that I do a heat, an intense degree of cold is pain. For to feel a very great cold is to perceive great uneasiness. It cannot therefore exist without the mind, but a lesser degree of cold may as well as a lesser degree of heat. Philonus. Those bodies, therefore, upon whose application to your own we perceive a moderate, moderate degree of heat, must be concluded to have a moderate degree of heat or warmth in them, and those upon whose applications we feel a like degree of cold must be thought to have cold in them. Hillis. They must. Phyllis. Can any doctrine be true that necessarily leads a man into an absurdity? Hillis. Without doubt it cannot. Philonus. It is not an absurdity to think that the same thing should be at the same time both cold and warm? Hillis. It is. Philonus. Suppose now one of your hands hot and the other cold, and that they are both at once put on the same vessel of water in an immediate state. Will not the water seem cold to one hand and warm to the other? Hillis. It will. Philonus. Ought we not therefore by your principles to con con conclude it is really both cold and warm in the same time, that is, according to your own concession, to believe in absurdity. Hillis, I confess it seems so. Philonus, consequently, the principles are false, since you have granted that no true principle leads to an absurdity. Hillis, but, after all, can anything more be more absurd than to say that there is no heat in the fire? Philonus, to make the point still clearer, tell me whether, in two cases exactly alike, we ought not to make the same judgment. Hillis, we ought. Philonus, when a pin pricks your finger, does it not rend and divide the fibers of your flesh? Hillis, it does. Philonus, and when a coal burns your finger, does it do any more? Hillis, it does not. Philonus, since therefore you neither judge the sensation itself occasioned by the pin, or, nor anything like it to be in the pin, you should not conformably to what you have now granted judge the sensation occasioned by the fire or anything like it to be in the fire. Hillis, well, since it must be so, I am content to yield this point and acknowledge that heat and cold are only sen sensations existing in our minds, but there still remains qualities enough to secure the reality of external things. Philonus, but what will you say, Hillis, if it shall appear that the case is the same with regard to all other sensible qualities, and that they can no more be supposed to exist without the mind than heat and cold? Hillis, then indeed you will have done something to the purpose, but that is what I despair of seeing proved. Philonus, let us examine them in order. What do you think of taste? Do they exist without the mind or not? Hillis, can any man in his senses doubt whether sugar is sweet or wormwood bitter? Philonus, inform me, Hillis, is sweet taste a particular kind of pleasure, a pleasant sensation, or is it not? Hillis, it is. Philonus, and is not bitterness some kind of une uneasiness or pain? Hillis, I grant it. Philonus, if therefore sugar and wormwood are unthinking corporal substances existing without the mind, how can sweetness and bitterness, that is, pleasure and pain, agree to them? Hillis, hold on, Philonus. I now see what it was that deluded me all this time. You asked whether heat and cold, sweetness and bitterness, were not particular sorts of pleasure and pain, to which what I answered simply that they were, whereas I would have thus distinguished those qualities as perceived by us as pleasures or pain, but not as existing in the external objects. We must not therefore conclude absolutely that there is no heat in the fire or sweetness in the sugar, but only that heat or sweetness is perceived by us are not in the fire or sugar. What do you say to this? Philonus, I say it is nothing to the purpose. 
our discourse proceeded altogether concerning sensible things, what you define to be the things we immediately perceive by our senses, whatever other qualities therefore you speak of as distinct from these, I know nothing of them, neither do they at all belong to the point in dispute. You may indeed pretend to have discovered certain qualities which you, you do not perceive and assert those insensible qualities exist in fire and sugar, but what use can be made of this to your present purpose? I am at a loss to conceive. Tell me then once more, do you acknowledge that heat and cold, sweetness and bitterness, meaning those qualities which are perceived by the senses, do not exist without the mind? Hillis, I see it is no purpose to hold out, so I will give up the cause as to these mentioned qualities, though I profess it sounds odd to say that sugar is not sweet. So I'm going to stop there as just the first part of reading three dialogues between Hillis and Philonis by George Berkeley.